That's how Christians should not treat one another. No provoking, no envying. Born of conceit. So how should Christians treat one another? Gets a bit lighter now, okay? Carry each other's burdens. And in this way you'll fulfill the law of Christ. There's how Christians should treat one another. You should all be little Sherpas carrying each other's bags. Now notice the assumption that underlies this teaching. The assumption is we've all got burdens. Does that make sense? It's always easy to look at somebody else and look at your own burden and say, what are they moaning about? They know nothing. It's easy to do that, isn't it? But the scripture makes it pretty clear we've all got burdens. And the job is to be helping each other with those burdens. The gospel that Paul's been defending in those preceding chapters is absolutely clear in Galatians 1 through 5. That we live in the present fallen age, clothed in vulnerable human flesh, and we have burdens to carry. And the Judaizers, in Paul's treatment of the situation, are trying to avoid the burden, a particular burden, that following Jesus would have brought to them in their world. Go back to chapter 5, verse 11. Can somebody read me 5.11? Have you got some? Somebody's got a Bible open there. In English. <coughs> Brothers, if I'm still preaching circumcision, why am I still, why am I still being persecuted? That is the verse I wanted, yeah. In that case, the offence of the cross has been abolished. Brothers, if I'm still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offence of the cross is abolished. In the situation that these Judaizers had come out of, and the one that Paul is addressing, the reason they are preaching circumcision to people is to avoid the persecution the Jews will give them for teaching justification by grace through faith alone. Jew and Gentile alone. Do you see the point? So these guys are coming and trying to impose on these Gentile Galatian Christians, circumcision, to avoid the persecution that flows from gospel truth. Is that making sense? The Judaizers are trying to avoid the burden. And Paul is saying what we need to do is to work together to bear one another's burdens. Does that make sense? We all have burdens, says Paul. We all have them. But we are not meant to try and carry them alone. And this is a really important point. It's the only other point I'm going to make today. So let's just see if we can get it. Some people are convinced that they should carry their burdens alone. And they think it is a sign of fortitude and gives them some superiority to carry their burdens alone. That's not Christianity, that is Stoicism. It's a rival philosophy from the ancient world. It is a pagan philosophy, it is not a Christian philosophy, and Paul is pointing to that in this book. Other people might point to verses like Psalm 55, verse 22. Cast your cares on the Lord and He will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall, that's true. Or they'll point to Matthew 11, 28. Come to me, says Jesus, all you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. And they say, there you are. You see, Jesus is good enough for Christians like me. It's only, it's only burden sharing is only for wimps. For those inferior sorts of Christians who are wimpy. Well, wimpy's a burger, isn't it? But, but you know what I mean? It's only for the weak. And the Christians who say that, with you know, burdens of their own to bear, they become conceited and they imagine they are above other people, not in need of having someone help carry their burden and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, let's be clear what we are and are not saying. Of course we must all cast our care on him because he cares for us. 1 Peter 5, 7 is another verse of that sort. But we're to have the humility to remember 
that we are frail human beings dependent on God meeting our need and it appears from scripture that God chooses to meet those needs very often through yes your relationship with him which is by grace through faith alone from first to last not of your own strength not of your achievement not because you're a strong person and, and a good Christian and a superior person and therefore you can deal with it but that one of the ways that he wills to provide for you in his weakness in, in your weakness is through the discipline of fellowship is through the ministry of God's servants, is through carrying one another's burdens to fulfill the law of Christ. Let, let's, let's just give you an illustration from the life of Paul to show we're not meant to carry these burdens that we all have, we're not meant to carry them alone. Striking example from the life of Paul. 2 Corinthians 7, 5-6. to Here's the story. Do you like the story? Caleb, here's the story. Paul's going through a hard time, okay? Paul's going through a hard time. He was horribly burdened. And the guy had a tough old life, let's face it. He was worried to pieces about the behaviour that had been going on in the cosmopolitan, so-called cosmopolitan, pagan, pagan situation of the church over at Corinth. And he couldn't get over there to see them himself. Now you know what that's like when you can't get there yourself. We had a situation years ago, didn't we? Ben was ill in Bosnia and he had pneumonia. He had it twice in six months. It was hey? Three times. Three times in six months. See, I know I got it wrong. I, I, I need him to help me with my failing memory. So there we are. We've got a boy who's in Bosnia on the other side of Europe and we can't get to him. We can't help him. And it's awful when you can't get to somebody to help him. Some of us know, don't we, from our own experience what it's like. Paul can't get there. And he's got a huge, big load of problems of his own. And he's even more concerned now about the response they're going to make to a rather stern letter he's had to send to them about what's going on. And his mind couldn't rest. And he's in great suspense. And here's, here's how he describes it over there in 2 Corinthians 7. Oh, he says, make room for us in our hearts. We've wronged no one. We've corrupted no one. We've exploited no one. I haven't been saying this to condemn you. I've, I've said before, you... You have such a place in our hearts, we would live or die with you. We have great confidence in you, we take great pride in you, and greatly encouraged. In all our troubles, my joy knows no bounds for. When we came into Macedonia, this body of ours had no rest. We were harassed at every turn. Conflicts on the outside, fears within. Poor old Paul. You know, he hasn't even got a wife with him to moan about all this, too, has he? God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us with a vision, or a revelation, or a relevant passage of scripture, or with a great stoicism of heart. He didn't. He comforted us by the coming of Titus. He comforted him through the companionship of a younger friend, a missionary inferior, who brought him companionship and reassuring good news of Corinth. Let's get this straight. This is biblical. God wants us to work on friendships that he can use. Friendships in which as Christians we bear one another's burdens. This is part of the purpose of God for his people. Fellowship is mutual. And it can't happen where we fail to recognise that the ground is level at the foot of the cross, where the doctrine of justification by grace through faith alone is etched into our daily thinking and experience. There's no turning around from Paul saying, Oh, Titus, you're, you know, you're, you're far inferior Christian to me. Why can't they send me Peter, James, or John or somebody? I don't know. There's no ground in the gospel for feelings of inferiority or superiority between brethren. And where the truth of the gospel that we're all equally justified by grace through faith alone is held on to and cherished. Who will you have help you? Are you humble enough to do that? Who can help and encourage? You've got to get this on board. We've got to have this right at the front of our heads. This church contains only black sheep, saved by God's grace. 
I found myself trying to reassure somebody of that last Sunday evening and said, come, 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 you know, come, you're fine, it's okay, we're all a bunch of basket cases. But I think I actually did say that. Um, <laughs> it's true. We are only black sheep. Because that's what the Gospel says about all of us. And there is no room here and there is no room in any Bible church for any theology of superiority. I'm better than you. This is a fellowship of equally great saved sinners. And our significance lies not in anything about ourselves, but in Christ on his cross. Raised from his grave. Ascended into glory. Our significance arises simply because the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. So all vain conceited barriers and impediments to God's predestined provision for the burdens we all have, it's removed. When we believe this doctrine of justification by grace through faith alone, because we will bear one another's burdens regardless of whether we feel inferior or superior to one another or not. And the elder will take the encouragement of the younger. And vice versa. Because we will not have this vain conceit that prevents it. Paul's message seems to be this. Take this self-contained attitude that arises not out of godliness, but out of a sense of smug superiority. Come off it and allow the law of Christ to be fulfilled amongst you. Why is it so important? Surely it's my choice. Whether I allow somebody to help me bear my burdens. Surely that's up to me. Why is it so important that we bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ? Well, there's the answer. This militant self-dependency born of smug superiority has got consequences. It prevents the law of Christ from being fulfilled amongst us. In the terms this chapter uses. How? Look at verse 2. Yes, we've only got as far as verse 2. Carry each other's burdens and in this way you'll fulfill the law of Christ. How are you going to fulfill the law of Christ? Carrying each other's burdens. I know this is a foreign language to me. Many who want to maintain that they stand for a biblical gospel of justification by grace through faith alone, but whose pride, whose human pride, prevents them from embracing the implications of that for accepting human help. Let's get this straight. If you want have it from me, have it from the now sainted stop. Now the guy's gone to glory. Hear this. Human friendship, he says, in which we bear one another's burdens is part of the purpose of God for his people. So, and please hear this bit. We should not keep our burdens to ourselves, but rather seek a Christian friend who will help to bear them with us. Stop. I mean, stop. Why is this discipline of fellowship important? Because by committing ourselves to it, we fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? The law of Christ is to love one another as he loved us. That's the only debt, remaining debt outstanding that exists for Christians. Let no debt remain outstanding. No legal obligation. Except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. That's the new commandment, isn't it, that he gave us? New commandment I give to you, love one another, so I've loved you. How will they know we are Christians? Says Jesus. By your love for one another? By your bearing one another's burdens? You know, it's quite impressive that to love our neighbour to bear one another's burdens, to fulfill the law, are three equivalent expressions. It shows that to love one another as Christ loved us may not lead to some heroic, spectacular deed of self-sacrifice, but much more commonly to the much more mundane and spectacular ministry of bearing one another's burdens. That's a great ministry. 
because it fulfills the law of Christ. <clears throat> Therefore, says Luther, Christians must have strong shoulders and mighty bones. Not to bear their own burdens, but to bear one another's. And so fulfill the law of Christ.